All right, welcome, welcome everybody. Thank you for attending our uh, our final season end data lecture. Uh, uh, as always, I want to uh, go ahead and uh, thank uh, our speakers committee uh, who have uh, provided funding for the data lecture series this semester. Without their support, we would not be able to bring in such amazing artists as we have had all semester long, every single Friday. Uh, today, we have with us the uh, the absolutely wonderful artist Khalil Robert Irving. Uh, I'll go ahead and give a brief introduction uh, in case you don't already know uh, this wonderful man who uh, lives and works in St. Louis. Uh, Khalil is uh, originally born in San Diego, California. He's an artist currently living and working in the USA. He attended the Sam Fox School of Design uh, and Visual Art uh, at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and uh, the Kansas City Art Institute for his BFA uh, in art history and ceramics slash sculpture in 2015. His artwork has been exhibited at the Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art in Kansas, the Arizona University Art Museum in Phoenix, and the Rhode Island School of Design Museum in Rhode Island, among others. Irving was selected to participate in the 2020 Great Rivers Biennial hosted by the Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis, where he's exhibiting a solo exhibition entitled At Dusk on view from September 11th, 2020 to February 21st, 2021. So it's still open, it's in town. Hopefully you guys can check it out. Uh, recently, uh, Irving was awarded the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundations grant and the Joan Mitchell Foundation grant in 2018. Uh, Irving's first institutional solo exhibition took place at Wesleyan University Center for the Arts in Connecticut and was accompanied by a full color catalog with essays and an interview. Uh, currently, he is presenting a large scale commission in the lobby at the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. Irving's work is also featured in Making Knowing, uh, Craft in Art from 1950 to 2019, and Nothing is So Humble, Prints from Everyday Objects at the Whitney Museum of American Art. His work is in the collections of the Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art in Kansas, the RISD Museum in Rhode Island, the Carnegie Museum of Art in Pittsburgh, and the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York. Uh, without further ado, if you will all give me a wonderfully warm welcome to Khalil Irving. My audio on. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, I don't know if Jerry is here, but you know I appreciate Emily and Jerry for inviting me and having me here to speak with you all today. I'm at home, as as many of us are, and I think I'm going to just give a. I'm going to show some. I've done one of these talks uh, a couple, of, several years ago, like four years ago, 2016, mm -hmm. and Jerry asked me to come, and I was in the middle of going to graduate school, and. And Jerry, I've known Jerry for, I mean, you know, maybe over almost 10 years, I think. And so she wanted me to just kind of touch on things that I've had going on recently, but I'm going to kind of talk a bit about uh, things that have occurred uh, from like graduating from graduate school to now. So open up my Google Slides. Bum, 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 bum. Presenter mode. Oh, sorry. Why did I do that? I'm not good at this digital stuff, even though I'm doing it all the time. So, as Emily shared, my name is Khalil Robert Irving, and I people have been asking me, you make so many ceramics, and I, I, I would say that I think of myself as a sculptor. I was born in San Diego, California, but I grew up in St. Louis, and this photograph of the arch looking to the courthouse uh, is very interesting. And as the position of as the, the photographer is standing in the Illinois side of the Mississippi River. And so what are the, po the poetic and the political implications of the, of the monument uh, for the gateway to the West and the old courthouse where uh, a very important case was heard in the 19th century kind of serves as a basis or a framework for a lot of the questions and thoughts that I have in the studio. This is an installation that I did with Sage Dawson, who has a project 
in Granite City called Standard. And it's a flag based project where she invites artists to present a flag. And I, I presented this flag called Many Men, Many, Many, Many Men Wish Death Upon Me, which is a black on black flag, part of a, a group that uh, abstract the different elements of the US flag. And this one is just the stars. It's referencing a 50 cents song, but it's also standing in a, a historically sundown town. And a sundown town is a say, racial, racially segregated community that is privileging uh, white people. And, and if you are brown and you go there specifically after dark, you may be met with uh, quite a bit of violence. And so this flag stands as a memorial to uh, people who have seen and been affected by violence uh, by the hands of white people. And then skipping ahead a little bit, I was invited to do a solo exhibition at a gallery called Calicoon Fine Arts in New York City on Delancey Street. And this is my, this is part of my installation entitled Streets Chains Cocktails. It was quite a departure from what I was specifically working on in graduate school, but I started to work through um, aligning moments in time that I had specifically been experiencing in the moment uh, of 2017 when the work was being made, but I was also recalling different experiences and different times of myself working in the studio and embedding older objects within newer objects, embedding uh, past times and past articles from the news onto con more contemporary and of the moment uh, sculptures. And so in the installation, there were 11 sculptures, a large work on paper and a limited edition uh, wallpaper edition. That was then the title, was then titled as the same of the show. And these sculptures were growing out of a, a kind of conundrum of trying to find place in, in making sculpture and, and finding a bridge between a material history uh, conceptual construction and social and historical implications of things that I uh, find important. And so here you see a sculpture that is um, table top size. It's about 14, 14 to 18 high, 20 inches wide and 15 inches deep. It's uh, the slip cast Soda bottles are covered in newspaper clippings and and um, brands, and it's those objects were made in 2014 when I was in undergraduate school. But I thought that it would be interesting to Im embed them within new works in 2017, because those works also marked a specific time of my own reflection and, and experience of dealing with the. Um, the response to the police of Michael Brown. And I hadn't had the chance to really process that information. And, and so Streets Chains Cocktails was a real um, vested space where I could uh, dig into a bit of those repressed emotions that I, I had been feeling. And so, yeah, it's nice to see this work. Uh, to go back. This is, yeah, this is the rear part of the gallery. You see a large work on paper in the distance and then two sculptures in the present or in the most foreground. And I presented them as artifacts and objects in space as if they had been amassed from somewhere else kind of collated together uh, in the gallery. And so as you walk through these um, Objects have they had detail and and moments where you have a, a constant discovery. And even for myself, still to this day, looking and thinking through this work, there were gestures that I had made in the work so quickly that I'm still working to parse out. From there, a woman at Wesleyan University Center for the Arts named Rosemary Lennox, uh, the program director there, she saw a review of my exhibition, the previous one in Art Farm Magazine, and they invited me to do a 3,400 square foot solo exhibition in this large limestone 
uh, gallery, half glass, half white walled. And it, it was born through a lot of drawings, a lot of uh, floor plan re renegotiations. And here you see street matter, decay and forever, golden age. Works on paper from 2015 to 17, brand new sculptures that were made for the occasion of the exhibition. A uh, wall work called Paneled Sky, Gray on Gray. And in the distance, you see a large mobile sculpture called Mobile Monument, uh, Mobile Monument, Road in Relief, Cortege, Malcolm Martin, Stop, Drop and Roll. This is the largest exhibition that I had completed up to that moment. And I just, I mean, I think it's still the largest exhibition I've made even to today, but it, uh, it combines several layers of things that I had been making over the last three years uh, into one space. And they really gave me the fluidity and the capacity to do what I wanted and, and pursue different avenues. I collaborated with a professor sociology department and he wrote an essay kind of like a sci-fi essay about the work and the political and social implications of what I'm working to achieve in the sculptures and it was such a wonderful opportunity to get to know students at the university and to now continue a relationship into the pandemic where they uh, invited me to and commissioned me to make a specific work for uh, an artist response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This work is entitled 100s and it's on view at the Whitney Museum of American Art and the, the collections exhibition that Emily mentioned. And from the first exhibition in New York to Wesleyan University, I had been moving through material and process so quickly that the gestures in the work kind of uh, got ahead of myself. And now looking back at this work, I'm starting to see some of the things that I did. And at the moment of making them, I was hoping and in desiring to achieve one thing that I did achieve, but then I also uh, achieved more. And so on the right side of the sculpture, you see a vase that is a press molded object with a stoneware body but it has a white clay embedded and then floral motifs uh, glazed on the surface. And it's almost as if the white clay object was fossilized and the cement or the ash filled the white object and burst it apart. Um, but the only parts that remain of the original object are these fragments. And so 100s most specifically relate to uh, Newport 100s, the cigarettes that my mother smoked. And in the middle bottom part of the work, you see something that recalls a Nike swoosh, but it's actually the swoosh of the brand for Newports and I just switched it up. I just turned it around. The reorientation and the flipping of iconography is uh, something that's important to me because everything that we think we know does not necessarily exist as as, as it seems. And so is there a way for the work then to hold that uh, information? Is there a way to complicate our uh, lived experience just as much as it's complicated with uh, social media and digital techno technology? But also the growing impersonal relationships that we are developing with each other. Um, becoming more, not only more and more isolating because of the pandemic, but because there's less hugging, there's less touching, there are less people having kids. And, and this intimacy is, a, is, a, is, is at a distance. And so the work for me, specifically this work is recalling histories of people working together to produce objects. Uh, and then kind of it all falling apart as you see the, the crumpling white clay in the middle with the ABC News headline telling stories about a police officer who was acquitted in 2017 for murdering someone. This is the rear part of the exhibition. So it was a quite a lot of square footage to cover. And I didn't, I took it like a huge responsibility and I worked night and day on the show. And here you see on the left is a, a, a geography map from the 
Missouri State University Springfield Geography Department. When it was dismantled, a friend gave me the map and it's, a, it's turned around so you don't see the information from the map because I didn't really, I don't really believe the numbers are correct, but it's the Negro population and I don't really like the racially just, just derogatory language. So I turned it around and the canvas back of the map mirrors the back of the canvas of the large flag on the large sculpture in the distance. And so there's a lot of parentheses that is occurring in the show um, along with the ground works or the, the, the works on paper that are referencing asphalt uh, to the gray panels on the wall referencing the clouds as the ground and the sky are parenthetical structures around our lived experience. And then the objects are uh, kind of remnants of our uh, experience and our throwaway or our uh, artifactual uh, sentiments. And in the foyer or the kind of um, post and lintel area, you see two flagpoles hanging, one with uh, a black on black striped flag and a black and white flag. And then on the right side, you see a black, a white on white striped flag. And it's called, I am ready, are you ready? And in the distance, you see a, a large 12 by 12 foot jacquard weaving of asphalt called Grounds for My Fathers and His Fathers and His Fathers and His Fathers Smoke and Ashes. And so the show is referencing the artifact. It's referencing my familial lineage. It's referencing um, personal, deeply personal sentiments of, for my mother who has uh, been passed almost 10 years. And it's really a, 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 was a great way to parse out ideas and be able to uh, flood my show with so much more information, even though the public wouldn't necessarily know those references, but there's a way for me personally to live within the work, no matter where it goes. And, and I can take a step back from it and have a little bit of security. This is a close up view of the doorway with the jacquard weavings. I, at this time, I had uh, got them all ordered and the ordering system was all one size. So I had quite a bit uh, of singular objects making up the whole one. But later on, I will tell you about another project that is gonna be um, even larger and more uh, succinct where it's not all different pieces, but they're all, it's all one unit. Uh, last fall, I presented a solo exhibition at Calicoon Fine Arts again. Uh, they, I don't know if many of you know about the gallery artist relationship. And uh, after my first exhibition, or right before, the gallery asked to work with me as an artist continuously. And so in that relationship, you should, if you sell anything, or if you can sign anything to the gallery and they sell it, they should pay you immediately. And a part of the agreement is that you would have a, an exhibition, a solo exhibition every two years. There's much more detail that I can share on, on that fact uh, about the professional side of things. Um, but this is my second exhibition and it's entitled Black Ice. Black Ice referencing a song that I grew up listening to by Goody Mob featuring Outkast from 1998 um, on their uh, album called Still Standing. And it was the single uh, for that album. It's also referencing the ice that forms on the asphalt. And it's also referencing the air freshener that you can buy and put in your car. And so the joining of these uh, poetic structures and references is very important to me. And I think that helps the work be grounded uh, in a lot of more, a lot more uh, places instead of just one and in the distance, you see a, a smaller sculpture that's five by five, a, a snippet of a large uh, wall vinyl cloud collage on the pole, and then four works on tile on the wall in the far distance on the right. This exhibition was a real departure from a lot of things that I had been doing in ceramic. And it's also the largest work that I have made to, up to today. It's eight by 14 feet made out of hand pressed dark stoneware tiles with inclusions. And I pressed all of them. And it was like for my ceramic folks who like this kind of information, it was 2,400 pounds 
to make uh, the large work and two smaller works. I had someone process them, make the clay for me, but I pressed all the tiles myself. Um, and then the surface is covered in decals and uh, luster and enamel. And I fired all of those um, by myself too. At this time, I was doing a residency and teaching fellowship at Alfred University in the New York State College of Ceramics. And I learned a lot there. And I learned that I don't, you don't need to be attached to an institution to do the work that you want to do necessarily. And so I quit my job and I uh, moved uh, full time. Well, I moved to St. I moved to New York City, still living part time in St. Louis. And so that allowed me um, a space and time to rectify this, this balance of uh, dependence. How do you deal with dependence? And one thing that I had wish I had listened to a little bit more when graduating from graduate school is buy my own equipment. As soon as I can get my own space and buy my own equipment, because that's one way to not have to deal with that dependency. Um, but you see in the show, this pull in directions, the very faint uh, essence of the sky above us, and then this huge pronunciation of this ground. I think of the ground that we walk on as a very uh, complex space because the road and the sidewalk is engineered. It's engineered for space for us to cohabitate in and on and, and pass by each other. And there are embedded histories in that engineering and objects and, and life that is kind of being pushed down uh, and not excavated underneath that terrain. And so this work is really uh, commenting on the possibilities of the layers of sediment and uh, amassment deep in the, the surface of that engineered surface. The, the ground also as a plane and the plane as a screen, a plane of a screen or the plane of a phone, a plane as just a flat surface in which information can be understood, transferred or represented. And so if I'm thinking of the ground and the engineered road and the unlimited or limited amount of space in which someone can traverse, can that information be embedded in the sculpture? Another reference for, for this work are Roman uh, mosaics, the Antioch mosaics from ancient Turkey in three to five AD. I went to the Baltimore Museum of Art and they have quite a collection of these objects. And doing further research, the Antioch mosaics covered floors, walls, and ceilings of public and private spaces telling political and secular narratives. And so I thought if they could tell political and secular narratives 2000 years ago, I could do it too. And I've been asked a lot about uh, appropriation. And one thing that I think about appropriation is that you can use iconography, you can use information, but you don't continuously just re-represent the exact thing that you see, but that you transform it. And so I am not working to recreate specifically Antioch mosaics, but create something with the same essence and power and veracity that uh, those mosaics uh, have uh, still to this day, even though many of them you will see in large fragments. Uh, this work is entitled White, uh, White Matter, White Text, and it's about the deal, it's about the, the the court investigation or court proceedings over Jason Stokely's acquittal uh, in 2017, and how he, uh, well, and how he wanted to also resue the government for malicious prosecution and defamation, even though he uh, had been murdered, some murdering someone. And the tiles are made by a company called American Olean, and it used to be in New York State. But then the corporate company moved its production headquarters to Mexico. So it's quite interesting for something to be branded as American, but it's being made in um, a non US based country still in North America. And uh, the juxtaposition of the white violence and uh, white supremacist action to the corporate white supremacist domination of industry uh, was an is an interesting 
uh, pull in it that I'm trying to uh, create space for in, in this work. And so I brought a, again a little bit of St. Louis to New York City. Along with that exhibition in the office, I presented this large work on paper. And I know a lot of people think of me as a ceramist and a person who makes ceramic sculpture or ceramics, but uh, I think a lot about a, a lot of different things. And I'm, I think I would say I use a lot of ceramics because it's cheaper than casting bronze or casting metal where I can get a trompoy object and re-represent something a lot faster and a lot cheaper than casting and making molds for objects for casting metal and painting them in, in painting metal. And so this work on paper is another uh, recollection of re-representing a, a fragment of the road, the fragment of the street. And it, it's three by eight feet. And this is my installation at the Contemporary Art Center Cincinnati entitled uh, Groundwater for Screen Falls. And it's a 28 by 40 foot digital collage. And actually these rolls behind me are that, is that vinyl wrapped up on pole. And I'm gonna be using the vinyl again and making another work for the museum. Uh, so the vinyl does not go to waste. I really don't like waste and I think uh, these kinds of projects can easily turn into quite a bit of it. And is also referencing digital waste and digital information that's uh, almost like a, a quick uh, moment of satisfaction or ecstasy and then we just move on from them, but we don't necessarily remember them. And so this exhibition traverses uh, an album by TALC, Crazy Sexy Cool, as a uh, as an album that's telling a narrative through the duration of the song. And as you traverse looking through the wallpaper, you will also see a kind of continuation within the information. But mostly it's all digital information that I'm interacting with uh, myself or it's images that I've taken. So it's my personal and social archive of my own experience living from day to day to day. There are anecdotes of things that are specific to different communities of people who may have reverence for certain information. There are large uh, breadths of political uh, statements or images like you see the uh, Senate voting again, or the House of Representatives voting on uh, the resolution of impeachment for the President of the United States. You see maps uh, of the Louisiana Purchase you see a image of a conservatory waterfall that's man-made in Ohio, and you see different songs that uh, are telling uh, instigational uh, comments as well, along with uh, other information. Thinking of images not only for the means of transferring information, but also as a tool or as a way to create texture. And so you see a lot of Google image searches, and those Google image searches not only have embedded information that is uh, specifically important to know, but it's also using it as a, as a kind of skin or cloaking device to hide some of that information. This is a collage in black and blue. And then I gave a talk last night and I thought it would be great to include this. This is music memorial and film greeting screening chained daily ritual and tribute terror from 2019 and it's a an addition on tile for the curator independent curators international and the the tiles to fundraise for emerging curators to be able to participate in different uh, international summits that the organization puts together and so i told them any sales of these works should go directly uh, to that uh, general fund for that purpose to break it down a little bit, you see Aretha Franklin multiplied in the middle of the composition. You see uh, circles, uh, radiating circles in the middle of the composition that are from a, a German uh, color theory book. You see Darren Wilson behind chain link fencing being congratulated about being alive by Jeff Rhoda, a politician. You see references to music, you see the arch, you see the Edwards Johnstone, and in the distance you see the, the warning or the 
um, that that's that's the, the the green screen that preempts you before a movie starts and says who the um, how the movie has been assessed and kind of confirmed by a government agency. And then on the right side, you see uh, Aretha Franklin filming this uh, implied scroll of memes talking about Jennifer Schultz, a doctor, a PhD professor at Stanford University who called the cops on a black family in Oakland, California, who just wanted to barbecue. And so you see, you see her calling the police on Medea, you call her, you see her calling the police on Rachel Dolezal, a white supremacist who appropriates black culture and black life as if she is black herself. But the Jennifer Schultz says, oh, hello, police. Oh, never mind. It's not a black person, it's Rachel Dolezal. And so there's space for comedy and comedic relief, but it's you know really not comical at all uh, to tell the se severity of, of this behavior. And in the bottom of the composition, you see a uh, you see a reference or a portrait of Hammett Blewett, my baritone saxophone professor uh, from high school, who was a, who started the World Saxophone Quartet in 1984. Uh, so this tile is a layered composition that embeds a lot of uh, information. And then on the right side, you see behind the screenshots of Spotify, you see something that says Kanye Asada. And it's a, kind, a lot of self-portraits of Kanye West wrapped in a corn tortilla. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, humor in, in the work in a way. And so you see Happy Alive Day, Darren. And so it's like Darren Wilson can still walk and be out in the world even though he's murdered someone. Someone might ask later, how do I sign my work? Well, I'll answer that question right now. Since a lot of the work is derived from social media or digital uh, spaces, I sign my work mostly uh, in terms of the digital collages or the, uh, the ceramic image transfer works with a portrait of myself, my name, and the date. So that's how I do that. And then Jerry really wanted me to get into the nitty gritty of my show at the Contemporary Art Museum. This is at dusk and it's uh, comprised of four or five sculptures, a light box, a series of works you know, in flag, a new tile work, um, a, a medallion, and then two collages that are 66 feet wide. And so the, the flag works talk about location and place and the complications of nationality, statehood and local government. Uh, there are some personal anecdotes throughout the so throughout the exhibition, and then there is a uh, quite guided uh, messages about things that even have happened in the museum itself. So you'll, if you walk through and look through the wallpaper, you'll see reference to previous exhibitions and previous artists who've exhibited at the Contemporary Art Museum and exhibitions that I find politically problematic. And, and I explain why they're problematic within the wall collage, uh, adjoining them and associating them with other means of problematics and uh, things that I believe and see as working. So one reference that I have been thinking about, I watch a lot of TV and this is a screenshot from Homeland. I think about season six where one of the main characters, best friends infiltrates a, um, a, a a troll farm basically it's a corporate headquarters and in the basement they have like all these computers that have fake facebook instagram and twitter that go online and literally just cause problems and so this character was going in to try to figure out what were they doing to uh up upend the political uh or the presidential election similar to what we experienced in real life with the 2000 and i yeah, the 2016 election. I would even argue the 2000 election because I don't understand how someone wins the popular vote, but they don't win the electoral. Like I just, it's just uh, confusing. And so the work, the work really builds on, on that confusion and builds on the, the layers of the screen and the possibilities of the screen and uh, the different dimensions of what uh, lens-based works can uh, do and how they can operate. I don't know if I have a slide. Okay, so 
I've also been collecting art for the last couple of years. And this is a work that I purchased by Nam June Pike from 1973. And it's talking about screen-based work. It's talking about when will artists have wall-to-wall -wall, uh, TV, when that will they have their own TV channels? When will museums have wall-to-wall -wall, uh, video installations? And since even though this is a vinyl, it's made up of many screenshots of many screens, mostly my own screens but they relate to um, iPad screens, the scale relates to cell phone screens, computer screens and television screens. And I, I only thought it was fitting to include um, this Nam June Pike in the show as a way to also uh, contextualize uh, some of the concerns and questions that I have. This is uh, downtown Norfolk, Nebraska, 1997 or 1998, depending on where I'm exhibiting the work. Um, it's a piece that I made in 2017 for a group exhibition at the Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art. And it's downtown Norfolk, Nebraska is a, is a place where I had frequented when I was much younger living with my mother. And so the, this work has a kind of pseudo biographical or like a poetic biographical uh, layering uh, within it, but it's not necessarily truly exposed unless you really know my uh, biography. And I really love it uh, sitting in front of the wall collage in the distance. And so this is a detail of the wall collage. A lot of it was made uh, at the beginning of the pandemic and uh, I worked on it all the way up until the end. So, I mean, I'd started it last year, but I really got deep into making it uh, when the shutdown occurred across the country and it allowed me just space and time to just focus on it. And I worked on it all the way up until July when it was like the very last minute to get it printed, which I really appreciate. And so you see in the middle me asking, where's Dana Schutz? Dana Schutz is an artist who made a problematic painting of uh, Emmett Till, uh, a, a man who was a young boy who was murdered about 70 years ago. Uh, and, and I'm making reference that she had something to say about uh, his death in 2017, but why not say anything about all the black people who are continuously getting murdered in her contemporary time in which she is living. But I also question why she make a painting of Emmett Till and not a painting of the white men who killed Emmett Till? Because it seems like she has a whole lot more in connection to them than they actually have in, con in, in relationship to Aunt Mammy Till and Emmett. Uh, even though she is a mother, she is more relative to the white people who murdered him. You see Oquion Wazer, one of the most important international curators who uh, passed in the last couple of years. You see a screenshot of Lisa Melandry's, the director of the Contemporary Art Museum's Instagram page. <laughs> uh, you see a, a hyperallergic article about a previous exhibition at the museum. And you just see like a, just a lot of stuff. You see fragments of the Missouri and Illinois state flag, which is also in the exhibition. So in a lot of ways, it's, it's literally just everything that I may have my hand on at any given time or any of the, uh, tabs that I have open. And so there are quite a few uh, spaces where things are layered uh, on top of each other, where I cut back the white spaces of uh, certain compositions or screenshots to allow for some of those things behind to peer through. Similar to how the sculptures are amassed uh, there are fragments that will peer through something else. Another image, I'm really captivated by this uh, point of view of standing on the Illinois side of Mississippi River and looking into St. Louis uh, downtown. So as we got through that, we go to the other side of the exhibition, the sculptures range from 2017 to 2019. So it's three years worth of work. And I I propose, I mean, I might as well just go ahead and say this to you all. I don't know, I didn't say it last night, but I proposed a very different exhibition. And since the pandemic occurred and everything's happening, I, I thought that it would be nice to bring work that would never necessarily be seen in St. Louis, 
but uh, this would be an opportunity to share with St. Louis and people who know me and know of my work, uh, what I had been up to for the last several years and then contextualize it amongst um, brand new uh, ideas and thoughts. Here you see the windows of the museum and then hanging in the window is a black on a black a blue lives support flag and a white on white striped flag with a white chain link fence embroidery. And so from the street, you see the blue lives support flag. But when you're in the museum, you look through the white on white flag with the white chain link fence to see the blue lives support flag. So you, you're seeing it through uh, walls, you're seeing it through uh, some kind of scrim. And it's not necessarily that I support Blue Lives Matter. I don't even think Blue, like there, and Blue Lives doesn't exist, but I think that there's a way that we can start to, and some people have uh, been working to physicalize whiteness uh, as much as everyone, a lot of people wanna say that black is not a color and white is not a color. Black and white are colors in pigment. And so if black and white are colors and pigment, are there, a way, are there ways to then uh, actualize uh, and reverberate or recall uh, situations that have occurred to kind of bring more palpability to them outside of this victim perpetrator relationship? And so color, it, the operatics of color is something that is really uh, interesting to me. I don't know if any of you know who this man is, but I, I referenced him earlier. This is Dred Scott and he uh, sued white people for his freedom. And the fact that a man had to, uh, that someone had to even do that and we're still contesting and fighting that today is uh, quite problematic. Uh, and Dred Scott did not live to be freed. He uh, passed away. Uh, and he, the family also didn't even win the case. Um, so just giving a moment to thinking about freedom and privilege and, and the capacity at which you have the will to live, you know, living through a pandemic ain't as bad as what many people in the past have gone through. So how do we continue to invest and evolve uh, our perspective of, of living and working? And what does it mean to live and, and to work? Uh, because some people have died working for things where they've never seen any uh, resolve for. And this is uh, part of the three parts of the flag work called uh, flag combine collected objects. And so you see the Missouri flag, the Illinois flag, the Gadsden flag, the St. Louis city flag, and a black on white striped flag. This gesture is about location. It is about place and the, 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 the location of which we uh, are right now, if everyone here on the call is in St. Louis, this uh, reference to location is also about the, the embedded uh, ideologies or politicization of, of said location or, or, or objects that are used as symbols to tell information about location. And so embedded in these flags is this Gadsden flag, which is a, 19th century naval flag that has been used for libertarian pursuits, but also uh, white supremacist and um, complicated uh, narratives around uh, don't tread on me. I mean, don't take my livelihood away from me. Don't take uh, from me what I deserve. And you know, white supremacists and a lot of Southern uh, communities or rural communities uh, use this flag as a way to think that the federal, the Fed is taking from them. Uh, and that's part of the, you know, the ideology of the state of Missouri. And even though Kansas City, St. Louis and Columbia have uh, pretty uh, democratic leaning thoughts. I mean, there are also, I would argue that there are also Democrats who also believe some of this ideology. So it just shows the complicated nature or is a is a testament to the complicated nature of, of, of nationality and statehood and, and place. Recently, I mean, people have been doing this for a long time, but I, as I was making these works, I didn't realize what everybody else in the world was doing. And here you see the Puerto Rican flag and the pride flag contextualizing each other. 
you know, they believe in their, their statehood, their nationality, they believe in where they come from, but they also believe in their, their right and others' rights to live and love and be with and care for who they want to live and love and care for. And, and, and this, this anchoring of ideas around the USA flag is something that is really interesting to me. And so the reason why the flag works are still in progress is because I'm working on a much larger project where I'm cataloging all the sundown towns and freedmen towns that have been established that are still living and thriving today or have been since dismantled. And so I will embroider each state's sundown towns and freedmen towns on each state's flags. And it's uh, gonna be a long process, but uh, it's, it's an exciting one. And here you see a caravan of people who support the presidential re-election of the current administration. You see USA flags, you see the Southern battle flag, you see the Gadsden flag in the distance, you see, you know, all of this information and, and using it as a symbol, but when do symbols not necessarily uh, portray exactly what you think you want them to mean? And so that's why I layered the Blue Lives Matter support flag with this white on white stripe flag as a way to use it as a, another way of looking through it uh, or looking to it. This work is titled Star Wars Street Wars. And it's similar to the work in my solo exhibition last year, uh, but smaller. And the orientation of framing the square tiles with rectilinear tiles is uh, because it kind of references a, uh, a doorway or a portal space. Before you enter a door, there's this kind of geometric shape that you stand on before you enter uh, a, 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 an interior space, similar to a doormat. Uh, but, um, but fortunately, you can't walk on mine, uh, but I, I really like it and here are some details. Oh, yeah, I just have one detail. That's so weird. It was not fuzzy last night. This is the last, this is the other side of the exhibition. So you see three sculptures on pedestal, work on tile in the distance, light box in the left, and the medallion on the right. Mixed messages, streets and screens, AOL plus lottery is the name of this digital collage in uh, the light box. I have been making collages since 2013. And making the collages has been a way of creating texture and putting images on the sculptures, but they all come from the internet and so at some point in time all of these images that you see in all of my work were moving and so i'm working with a designer and computer engineer to make digitally interactive work so that you can re-engage re this information and these images um, despite their stillness in, in the other work that i'm making I made this specifically for the Contemporary Art Museum, St. Louis, and a solo exhibition that I have in San Francisco of the same name. This is a detail. And then this is White Matter, White Text, the DOJ in Memorandum. Uh, Darren Wilson, pages one through 86, and it's the fragmentation of the DOJ's investigation of, of, of Darren Wilson killing Michael Brown in 2014. On the far left, you see one of those tiles that are of the addition of the work that I mentioned earlier, because that work is making comment about some of the things happening. I take the text and work through a, a means of abstraction that then also maybe allow for some of the things in the text to come through and then also hide a lot of other things. Uh, it's, it's a challenging text and it's a difficult text to read. And I think because of the speed it takes to read it or the, the anxiety it takes to read it, 
the, 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 the quickness of the layering of the text uh, relates to the screen, but also the blurry understanding one may have uh, with the emotional uh, experience they're having kind of going through uh, the content. And so in a lot of ways, it's a design issue. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's a textual issue. Uh, in some, some ways, it's a political issue. Uh, and, and the work at the museum is really a kind of just a place marker for this information. Also, um, the previous exhibitions, Bethany Collins, uh, she took the Ferguson report and embossed it on white paper. And I thought, well, if, if someone from not this town can make work about this information, I'm damn sure gonna make some work out of this information so that other people don't have ownership over it and, and it's not uh, becoming lore, but that it still is a real thing and it's an active document that is still living and breathing and has effects on our day-to-day -day life today. And this is when exiting my installation, you uh, into the rest of the museum and in the distance, the program that I was awarded uh, to be a part of the Great Rivers Biennial, uh, also it awards three artists from St. Louis. And this year is myself, Tim Portlock and Rachel Yoon, uh, who are the recipients of the honorarium and the solo exhibition. But at the museum, there's also an exhibition of Ebony G. Patterson, who is a good friend of mine and also attended Washington University for her master's degree and graduated in 2007. So if you have the chance to go by the museum, I have some friends who work there and they say that it's been really slow. So you would have the museum all to yourself uh, if you choose or if, if you choose to go again or if it would be uh, your first time. I think that's my last slide and uh, appreciate you all having me here today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Khalil. Uh, so we, we already had a couple of questions being put in the chat while you're talking. So we'll just kind of run through a couple of those. Uh, we have uh, Emily Muller who's asking, can you talk about the process of how you constructed this collage with it being so large scale? Did you focus more on smaller sections or did you were you sort of like, I suppose, scrolling out to sort of see the, the macro effect? Uh, I believe she's talking about the, the work at CAM. That work, I mean, all the wall collages are a little bit concerning and like complicated to deal with because I'm, I have such a small computer screen, I have like a 15 inch. And so scale really shifts quite a bit when it starts to be printed. And I, I think as I get older and I keep making more work, I will care more about scale. And some things I do intentionally increase in scale, um, but in a lot of ways, I also just don't care and just like kind of let it be what it, as it lives, as its file size in a way. And some things do get shrunk and some things do get bigger. But since my computer is also only so big, I can only work on the work one part at a time. And so I will try to create the largest, uh, if I break the dimensions down, into fragments. What are the largest fragments that I can work on at any one given time? And then I stitch them together. And so for this for the exhibition at CAM, I could do uh, six by 11 feet. And so I did six collages that are six by 11 feet. And then for the Contemporary Art Center Cincinnati, I made, I think it was like 12 by 50 feet. And I had four strips. So it was, yeah, it was almost a perfect square of 50 by 50. Wow. Um, but I could only do those in skinny strips, yeah. so. Uh, let's see, we've got uh, Jeff Hughes uh, is interested at what point information overload could become desensitizing and de-emphasizing a message uh, to a more formalist aesthetic experience. Yeah, you know, the, I, I think one way that I navigate all of that and from all of that is the fact that there are many, many entry points into the work. There are ways to get into the work where people will not hear any of the things about white supremacy and violence, or they'll hear it or they'll see it, but they'll only see it as decoration. Mm -hmm. 
there are things that people that look like me who will walk through the show and like pick out very specific things and walk away and be like, all right, he did it. Congratulations. You know, and then there are spaces for me. So I think, I think as we all do, we pick and choose what we want to hear, even though it may or may not be true. Yeah. You know, it's this complication between fact and truth, you know, or true, uh, real and unreal, visible and invisible. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the complication and the multi-layering of all of it allows for, uh, for all of these things to occur simultaneously. Uh, and then also I'm trying to, I also, I was talking with a friend of mine who's a curator and we walked through the show or we didn't walk through the show, but we talked about it. She walked through it and she said, you know, the perspective, perspective is also challenging. How uh, something is oriented uh, disrupts uh, how the images and things can also be read. And so there are some embedded aspects of the work where their bodies or people or sculptures laying on their back and their hands are outreached like this and they're being pulled away, you know, like removing of statues. So how I'm trying to also think how do those kinds of things also come into the work, but it's also diaristic in a lot of ways that, you know, is there anything for you to get from it? You know, I don't, I don't know if I'm necessarily saying any specific things, but kind of touching on a lot of uh, a lot of points simultaneously. It also feels like just like your mood presented to us from this year. Um, I'm glad you I'm glad you encouraged everybody to go uh, visit the show again because I do think we get you know I, I saw the show on opening night but now even just seeing your images of the work like I think it changes each time you view it so I, I think this is, you know, one of those shows where like a repetitive viewing, uh, I think, adds something uh, to your experience. You might not get it the first time. You might not, you know, tap into it, you know, the first time you visit. But upon multiple viewings, it's like it it shows itself to you, or at least that's my response to the work. We got a question from Jerry. Uh, Jerry says, what was your original proposal <laughs> and will you be working on it in the future? uh which i'm i'm curious just as a person who's applied to the grb what was the what was the original plan i guess pre-plan pre-pandemic right the original proposal was to make these sculptures that referenced uh, st louis architectural elements and so there would be these large scale sculptures that took fragments of uh, roofing tile and brick that built form in time and space. Mm -hmm. And then there will be wall paintings of uh, two sided plexiglass that were from the building that I own that I'm in right now that covered the windows because yeah. this building used to be a, um, a hardware store. And so the, the, the plexi has remnants of this history on it that I wanted to kind of polish and uh, bring back to life uh, and, and just make note of this uh, multi-layered experience that, that we're living through uh, in this city, which has such a, like St. Louis used to be one of the largest cities in the country, you know, and it, and it has, the metropolitan area has almost 4 million people living in it, but in the city itself, there are less than a half a million people who live here, less than 400,000 people who live in the city. And so why is this disparation uh, embedded in, in the place and in the space? And so the show was uh, going to kind of recall the history of white flight and, uh, and white violence in the city uh, in terms of uh, allowing for decay and divestment in certain neighborhoods and communities. Uh, in spaces, but also revel in the history of the architecture of this place where there are many feats of engine, engineering and, uh, and uh, invention in terms of design uh, present within the physical space. Mm -hmm. And so that was the original uh, proposal for the show. And I made a maquette and I made like an architectural maquette of the museum. And I had little sculptures and little figures that were walking through it. And I still have thoughts about that work, but I also I have a good friend and someone I look up to whose work is very similar to some of those things. So I'm also trying to figure out how I'm like glad I didn't make that work fully for Cam. First of all, I also didn't make it because it would have 
I, I see that show as a greater uh, set of information and a greater show than what a biennial exhibition opportunity like this yeah. would be because with my show at Wesleyan, I had research help. At my show at the gallery, I have help that helps me kind of figure out how to navigate some things. And for CAM, they let they make you have to do most of it all on your own. Mm -hmm. And you have to make all the work on your own on your own. You have to pay for everything on your own. You know, it's like, I want a real commission from a museum. This biennial exhibition is great for experience and to show in St. Louis. But I also think that, uh, that when, work, when you're working, work you can get that stuff. investment, huh? I was just saying, that, yeah, that sounds like a show that is so specific and important or could be very important to St. Louis that like, yeah, it needs the resources like behind it. It's not a $20,000, it's not a, it's not a $5,000 show or whatever honorarium they want to give me. It's like, yeah. it's, it's an archive show. It's a, it's a historical show. And so I just want the, the stature of the institution to match uh, the the level of that investment that I would be putting into uh, the work. So maybe I will have a show at SLAM here soon. I won't, I'm not saying anything, but I might have a show at SLAM in the next few years, which would be really great. And that would be awesome. I'd love to work with uh, Hannah Clem, the associate curator of modern and contemporary art. And um, what's her name? Uh, Elizabeth Wyckoff, the curator of prints and drawings for the St. Louis Art Museum. So as students, to be honest with you, despite the fact that you may be online uh, and for everybody here, despite we may be online in this pandemic, it's no, no better time to reach out and have meetings and visits with people and to get to know people in, in the community because um, that is the way I got to where I am. Like I've known Jerry for so long, you know, Jerry and I go back you know, almost 10 years or so. So it's like, you know, the, the more you invest and, and uh, love on the people and get to know the people around you, the more successful uh, your career can be if, if you put the brevity in the work that uh, it, it takes to, to be aware where, where you wanna go. All right. Well, I think on that note, We'll let you go. I know you are a busy man and you've got plenty of stuff to do today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we were so lucky to have so many good speakers and I'm glad that we were able to sneak you in for the last one uh, of the semester. Uh, I want to thank everybody for attending all semester long and we will be back in January with more excellent speakers. Yeah. Uh, Khalil, you have a wonderful day and we'll have to catch up soon. Yes, thank you. Nice to see you all. Nice to see you, Jeffrey. Nice to see you, Jerry. All right. Everybody have a great finals week. Bye. Bye. <laughs>